introduction. My name is Josie Liana Kay and I'm the Assistant Director of CICR. I'm happy and honoured to welcome today Alvaro de Soto and Frances Vendral for the event on negotiating peace during civil war. I would like to highlight that this is the second of the conversations with Alvaro de Soto, a series of talks taking place at CICR with high-level mediators and actors involved in international conflict resolution. The series was launched last month with Shlomo ben -Ami, the former Israeli foreign minister. And I'm, um, before handing over to Alvaro de Soto, um, who will introduce Francesc Vendral, I would like to offer some words of introduction for Alvaro de Soto. An ambassador in the Peruvian diplomatic service, he spent 25 years in senior positions at the United Nations from 1982 to May 2007. Before joining the United Nations, Mr. de Soto served Peru as a career diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, at the United Nations headquarters in New York, and in Geneva. His UN career began with 13 years in senior positions in the Secretary General's office and five years as Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs. Among his many assignments in peacemaking and peacekeeping during that time, Mr. de Soto was the Secretary General's personal representative for the Central American Peace Process, leading the 1990-1991 negotiations, which ended the decade-long war in El Salvador. From 1995 to 1999, he was the Secretary General's Special Envoy for Myanmar. From 1999 to 2004, he led the negotiations on Cyprus, which produced a comprehensive settlement proposal that was submitted for referendum in 2004. He was Secretary General Special Representative for the Western Sahara from October 2003 to April 2005. And his last assignment from May 2005 to May 2007 was as UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. So we're very honored today to have Alvaro de Soto with us, as well as our special guest, Frances Vendral. So I'd now like to pass over to Alvaro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josie. Thank you. Well, it's my uh, great uh, not, a, not only uh, my honor, but also my great pleasure to introduce uh, Francesc Vendrell. Now, I have to say at the outset, in the interest of full disclosure, that uh, uh, Francesc is a friend. So that means that uh, I, I will be uh, within the spectrum between hard talk and Charlie Rose. I will be closer to Charlie Rose in the course of this conversation than I would be to hard talk. Heaven say, I will watch Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can watch him tonight at 11 <laughs> on PBS. <laughs> anyway, uh, in, in any case, it is, it is uh, less, uh, less severe, un unless you start becoming elusive on me, in which case you shall be pursued into the most re recondite corners uh, until the truth is out. Now, Francesc Vendrell has had a very, uh, uh, is, 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 well, is, is well known uh, now in the, and has become so in the past uh, few years because of his work on Afghanistan, where he represented the European Union for several years until recently. And before that, where he was the UN's man in uh, Afghanistan. Now, that's what he's best known as today. But he had a long career before that at, at the United Nations that has uh, uh, taken him uh, uh, globetrotting in a, in a very uh, broad way. He has uh, been involved since the start of his career at the United Nations. Uh, in decolonization matters, which took him to Africa uh, quite uh, a bit. And uh, he w uh, has been uh, involved when uh, you, the United Nations resumed, after a long period of sort of uh, political hibernation, uh, resumed uh, diplomatic activities as a, as a conflict uh, resolver starting in the 80s. He played uh, a role, uh, direct or indirect, uh, deep or uh, superficial, in a number of the issues that have at some point uh, been 
uh, part of the UN's responsibility. And that in stretches all the way back to, in 1994, the South Atlantic War over the Falklands Strokes Malvinas, as they are called at the United Nations. And then, uh, sorry, 82, did I, did I say, sorry, 1982. And then uh, subsequently where we sort of uh, joined forces uh, in Central America in the second half of the 80s. He has uh, also uh, been deeply involved and for many years uh, in the uh, efforts uh, to uh, r restore uh, uh, East Timor to a position where it could dis uh, determine its uh, own fate and uh, he has also worked on Myanmar and Asia and the Pacific more broadly speaking, which, because that was his responsibility as part of the, the Department of uh, Political uh, Affairs. And uh, finally, of course, uh, Afghanistan. Now, uh, I take a risk in trying to enumerate this because he's been involved in so many of these uh, uh, issues that uh, I always uh, sort of incur the danger of forgetting one or two, and I hope that you will accept my apologies if I have uh, done that. Now, I, if I may add on a, on a personal uh, note, uh, Francesca is a, um, at the UN, I think, uh, has been one of the most successful trailblazers and troubleshooters. Now, troubleshooters, there's a certain ambiguity, of course, in the world of troubleshooters, because sometimes he got himself into troubleshooting, into trouble for some of his troubleshooting. Perhaps we'll get into that later, <laughs> if you're willing, Francesc. Sure. Uh, but uh, he has uh, been, uh, during his time at the United Nations, a, a fierce defender of the uh, role of the United Nations as conceived in the Charter and in practice over the years. And uh, he has uh, conducted himself with great independence, and I should say with political courage, uh, a, a type of courage that is not always um, common. And uh, he has been willing to take uh, risks. Uh, when you take risks, you sometimes are successful, and uh, when, uh, however, sometimes you are not, or either that or you will tread on the toes of someone. Uh, but uh, unless you do, uh, sometimes you will simply fall short of what is uh, required. Now, I suspect that many in the uh, public will want to talk about the most contemporaneous and the most burning issue uh, on which Francesc can speak authoritatively, which is, of course, Afghanistan and the whole knot of issues that uh, surround Afghanistan, including Iran, Pakistan, and all of these things that are uh, very much in the uh, uh, public eye these days. But uh, we are, have, until about 7.30 in total, what I would like is to leave that more toward the end. And in before that, and, and I would I, uh, like to have is perhaps 30 or perhaps up, up to 40 minutes of questions uh, from the public in the uh, starting at about 6.50 or, or 7. But before that, I would sort of like to uh, guide him Socratically uh, into some of the areas that on which there might not be uh, questions. Uh, simply because his role in uh, these issues is less well known than uh, on Afghanistan. So I'd, I'd like you to take from the, the beginning. You studied, uh, you studied law and got your law degree in Barcelona, and uh, you then went to Cambridge. I mean, London, he's got and Cambridge. London and uh, Cambridge. Now, what took you to the UN? Why did you go to the UN? What were you? Well, thinking? I mean, after having, after three first degrees, uh, two in law and one in history, I was almost unemployable. And I thought that the UN was my obvious destination, apart from the fact that I didn't want to work for the dictatorship in Spain. I 
see. Right. Well, that's that's a pretty persuasive reason. <laughs> it, it, it seems it, it, it seems to me. But I mean, note out there those who are making a career of uh, accumulating degrees. Uh, the, the cautionary words of uh, Professor Vendrell, who I should have mentioned is now teaching at the Woodrow Wilson School as, as a visiting uh, uh, professor. Now, did you have any, uh, you make it sound almost as if you backed into the UN, that you just joined the UN because, I mean, that was the only well, thing Well, not really. Do. I mean, in, me if what, you, you have if a dream. You, uh, uh, someone in the, in the law faculty in Barcelona uh, saw what three or four of us wrote in 1961, I was 20 when, at that time, and we were asked what would I like to do, and I apparently wrote down what at the United Nations. Of which you have no recollection, apparently. Uh, no, I have a recollection. I've forgotten that it actually has an actual record of it. I see, I see. But did you, uh, what was in, at that time, uh, in your mind, what did you associate with UN? What did you well, think would be your, I, I think, your career uh, there? Well, I think first uh, one associates it with first internationalism. I had uh, spent five fantastic years in England uh, in, a, in a very international environment, particularly when I was at Cambridge. We had some of the mo most interesting conversations about politics at that time. And I mistakenly, I might add, believed that the same would continue to occur if I joined the UN. And, uh, <laughs> and I was interested in international affairs. I was not, I'm not a nationalist. Um, and I liked what the UN stood for. Right, okay. Now, uh, at, at some point, which is more or less when your career and mine uh, converged, um, you, toward when the, the, the Cold War was waning, uh, so to speak, uh, did you see uh, an opportunity arising for the UN that you had not seen previously? I had always thought that the UN had a lot of opportunities, but simply wasn't, uh, wasn't really using them as much as they could. Um, I think that was an, a, an excellent opportunity when East Timor was invaded by Indonesia to, to do something. Um, instead, uh, a combination of factors. One, the fact that Indonesia was very well positioned in internationally to withstand pressure, being on the one side uh, one of the key allies of the US in anti-communist terms, but at the same time being a Muslim nation, a member of the non-aligned non -aligned movement. Founder. Uh, that, of course, gave it a lot. And there were quite a lot of people in the Secretariat who were less than courageous. And I shall never forget when I wrote a report, in the, uh, or the annual report, on East Timor for the Committee on Decolonization. And um, as um, and I entered the room of my supervisor, uh, and I found him sitting with my report, net with in the Indonesian sitting at the other end of the table, uh, with a red pen. Um, and I'll never forget that. I, of course, uh, went higher to complain. Um, I got away with two-thirds of the report. The rest was actually uh, written off. But I did, I did manage to say one thing that I think upset the Indonesians a great deal. I simply said the population of East Timor, according to uh, the Portuguese authorities in 1974, was 685,000. The Indonesian census of 1980 gave a figure of 550,000. So here was 130,000 less people, not counting even for the normal rate of growth. That did not please Indonesia, even though later they accepted me as uh, a mediator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, tell us about uh, your your role in um, in the South Atlantic War, which is a bit of a relic. Well, that's where you and I began to, to, to we began to touch base. Um, well, I thought. Uh, uh, I think, in a way, I was perf I was the perfect person for the for the South, South for the Falkland Malvinas conflict, 
because on the one side I, I was from Spain, on the other side I'm a Catalan and believes in the self-determination rather strongly. I lived in England long enough to be rather keen on England, as some of my colleagues here uh, would probably attest. So I, I thought that was rather an interesting moment. But, I mean, and uh, I felt that uh, this was a classic case where, where if uh, the Argentines lost, and it was at the end of the day an invasion, it would probably lead to the restoration of democracy in Argentina, which is, as you know, what happened. Precisely what, uh, what happened. Now about Central America, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, I, I learned when we started to suspect that there was a possible role to be played because international efforts uh, to do something about the Central American crises of the 80s were not being very successful. I found that uh, uh, Francesco Andrell was the go-to person in the uh, Secretariat because uh, he's a very assiduous student of issues and he may not tell you this, but uh, he is, uh, among other things, very fond of collecting uh, data about people and places that uh, you would normally uh, associate with trying to, uh, uh, to understand uh, the issues. Let, let me just mention by way of example, until not long ago, uh, Francesco was able to rattle off uh, the dates, or well, at, at least the years of birth of every single member of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Well, more or less. More or less. But that was a stupid, I don't know how I turned out that. It, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the history, I suppose, the, right. the yeah, history <laughs> that, that brings you into that. But anyway, he was the, uh, the go to person. Now, in Central America, the United Nations didn't fare too badly, I, I think the record will, think will show we, by we and large. Pretty well. I see, I see. I'm, I'm playing it down so that you can play it up. <laughs> uh, but uh, w one uh, remarkable moment was when the United Nations um, managed to get its foot in the door uh, in the Central American international efforts to do something about crises in in Central America, and it fell to us to organize a tour by uh, what was then known as the uh, Verification uh, uh, Commission. Yes. The, the International, the International Commission on verification, verification and Support. And Support of the Central American uh, Peace Process, being created by the Central Americans themselves. And we had a very limited number of days, five or six days, during which we had to see everyone. And uh, the members of this International Verification Commission, who were, which were many, it was the five Central American countries, plus the Contador a, a group, Contador and plus support the support group, plus the UN and the OAS, as about 15 or so. Yeah. But, I mean, they were all quite happy that somebody was taking charge of organizing this tour, which means that Francesc was organizing this tour. And it turned out to be an extraordinarily revealing excursion, which uh, uh, led to meetings with representatives of sectors of society, as well as with officialdom in all five uh, Central American countries, which were highly revealing. Now, uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about organizing this? How did you uh, dig up the names? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, I don't know if we ever discussed it. I'm, uh, uh, I mean, the way, I mean, we both wanted to get the UN involved in Central America. Let's, let's be quite honest about that. We felt that, that there was something which we could do, and we also thought that it was uh, totally undesirable for the U.S. to consider that Latin America was its charge garde, its backyard, and that we could, we were out of it, and that 
if anyone had to do anything, was the OES. And the key, and there are three things. One that perhaps you, you, you will know very well, that was when you and I, or of course, Perez de Coelho wrote the letter. We, together with the OES Secretary General, wrote a, a letter to the presidents of the Central American countries offering our services. Uh, two, I, um, I had developed, even before we met, good relations with the guerrilla representatives who were in New York in connection, uh, in, uh, the guerrilla representative meaning the Guatemalan and Salvadorian guerrilla, who were in, uh, installed in the building in UN Plaza, the, the, the church building, and, um, and who, were for, um, who were lobbying uh, the, the human rights uh, people, because the, uh, both the, the, the Commission on Human Rights and the Third Committee of the General Assembly annually condemned the situation of human rights in Guatemala and Salvador. And that, I think, is what made it a bit easier then, to work out whom to see when we went to on that uh, excursion to to. To, to Latin, I mean, to Central America. Yes. There was also one occasion on, on, on uh, during a visit by Perez de Cuellar as Secretary General to Cuba, where uh, uh, Fidel Castro uh, introduced to the Secretary General to two representatives of the FMLN who yes. greeted exactly. them and then left them uh, with, with us, with and, and that sort of started to deepen right. the uh, the. Contacts, and then of course there was the the trip. Um, uh, I mean, I went to uh, a meeting of the Non-Aligned Movement on behalf of the Secretary General that took place in Zimbabwe, in Harare, in 1988. Uh, at that time, of course, we were already partly involved and in Central America, particularly in Nicaragua. But I think for for you and for me. Uh, Salvador was a much more interesting case, and for me, always Guatemala was the most interesting, probably because it was <coughs> horrible in terms of its past. But I rem it was in uh, May 1988 that the non-aligned movement had a meeting in Zimbabwe. Uh, I, the FMLN in those days had a kind of observer status in the NAM. It was a still a time when this is the uh, insurgent coalition this in is the El insurgent Salvador. coalition in El Salvador, and I met with the representative this time, the, the real people. That was uh, Shafiq Handal and Ana, Ana Guadalupe um, uh, Martinez. Martinez, and uh, I thought I had persuaded them to accept the UN as the mediator for El Salvador, if of course the government would agree. And then they went to meet Mugabe. And this was, the, uh, you may recall, oh, yeah. shortly after the process in Namibia started in terms of giving the country independence, the then special representative of the Secretary General, uh, who is now a Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Atisari, was in, uh, in Namibia. And Swapo infiltrated from Angola into Namibia uh, against what had been agreed uh, beforehand. And, um, and the South Africans, who had the, which, which still had the army in Namibia, asked uh, Atisari if he would authorize them to go to the north and fight off the Swapo, which Atisari did. And uh, more people were killed on the Swapo side. Uh, in that encounter, that in that single encounter, than in, on any other encounter between Swapo and the South African forces. So, uh, so uh, President uh, Mugabe uh, said to the FMLN, "Don't trust the UN. Look what is happening in Namibia. Uh, you have a, a special envoy who is basically pro-South African." So, they came back to me. They said, compañero, 
that doesn't look too good. Look what uh, we've been told. I said, well, look, you know, it depends who is who. It depends who is going to do the negotiations. So some of us are not an easy push. Um, and that's when we, that process also, we gave it. And then, of course, you, and I came with you, you had the meeting in yes. uh, But before, in we get to, be, before we get to that, the, the background to this, for those who are not familiar with it, is that the, sort of the blueprint uh, for self-determination in what became Namibia uh, had been drawn up many years before in Security yeah. Council Resolution 435. And it had an, an, a detailed implementation plan, uh, including uh, what would happen. Uh, that also, part of it was that the South African uh, security forces would be cantoned, they would be confined uh, to barracks, and the UN civilian uh, police, right. which for the first time would be deployed in large numbers, probably the most important component of the entire uh, uh, operation, would be deployed, airlifted uh, from day one. So there would be no vacuum. But what intervened in order to foil these well-laid plans was cost-cutting. Uh, they were not airlifted. And so there was a vacuum that lasted several weeks. And I was actually at the New York end of this. I right. took Amartya Desari's call where he said, listen, uh, the South Africans are saying that uh, the agreement uh, has not been held up. Your people are not here, and Swapo has infiltrated right. thousands of, of fighters, and uh, they are asking uh, for a uh, sort of a, a moratorium on the uh, cantonment in order to reestablish law and order. And he consulted the Secretary General. The Secretary General felt that he had absolutely no choice in the matter. But, I mean, uh, there is this, this little thing. Uh, I'm the cost just cutting. quoting, I'm yeah. quoting no, 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 what absolutely. Mugabe said. But I'm this is just in order that, to... No, no. I'm not saying that uh, uh, Martia Tisari was wrong in doing it. No, no, of course not, no. But, in any case, so this leads us to, this leads us to the first point at which, following an FMLN offensive in El Salvador, uh, both sides began to, you know, with all other would-be mediators having fallen by the wayside, uh, approach the UN, including the FMLN, who asked to uh, meet us. And they raised this question, and they raised some ideas regarding how to counter the problem of possible uh, undue or partisan pressures on the uh, Secretary General. They still had, don't you feel, some lingering doubts oh, yes. about whether UN would be the right. right third party? Tell us. Well, I think they had doubts also because I had suffered an, an accident in shortly before that meeting in, um, in Quebec in Montreal, Montreal. the FMLN. I had been given, since I was more junior in hierarchy than Alvaro, I had been given the less appealing task of going to meet the Contras during, and persuade them to do something that we knew fully well they weren't going to do, which was persuade them to re, uh, give up their weapons, return to Nicaragua, participate in the elections. And uh, with this easy task, um, I was sent to Honduras, and from Honduras, from Tegucigalpa, I drove to uh, Yamales, which is where the Contras were, were staying. And I met with the leader of the Contras, Colonel Bermudez, and it was clear that, that we were going to get nowhere. But anyway, I thought that it was important to bring the international media with me to show that the Contras were not willing to demobilize, but that we had done our very best. But um, I had not expected an invitation by Colonel Bermudez to go with him to, uh, to a field where I would meet, he said, the average contra. The, the, and I was suddenly faced with a, a very short trip where I ended up in a field with about 3,000 contras, fully armed, um, and uh, who presented arms to Bermudez, sang the Nicaraguan national anthem in Honduran territory, 
and uh, Colonel Bermudez took the bullhorn and decided to say in public uh, to everyone who, to the international media, which was there too, to say that they were not going to surrender, that they were going to, st they were going to stay where they were. And as he was talking, I began to have the feeling that I would get the bullhorn in my hands. And uh, I had quickly to decide whether I would be a classic bureaucrat, uh, a la UN, or a la many others, not only the UN. Bureaucrats, bureaucrats exist everywhere, including in restaurants, when they give you a small table for one person when there are 20 <laughs> vacant ones. Anyway, uh, um, a subject of particular sensitivity. For uh, but um, at any rate, I thought, well, this is my opportunity to tell the country, give the countries the message. So I took the bullhorn and I uh, extemporaneously spoke to the countries, telling them that the time had come to return to, to Nicaragua, that there was an opening, that there would be a chance, that they were in foreign territory. And I thought, at the end, I thought I would use my most persuasive line. And I said in Spanish, beware that you are not betrayed by those who are now supporting you. So the following morning, the Washington Post published me in the front page with a photo with myself and Colonel Bermudez. Very and elegant goggles and a bush jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, Contras is stunned by the, uh, uh, Contras given a tough message, Contras is stunned by the message or something like that. And by the time I read that already, uh, well, I take over James that. Baker had, and I, came, I, came, I came in, I came into the office that, that was morning. In September 89. Yes, it was also in the Times uh, as well, without yeah. a photo. Uh, and uh, the Secretary General already received a call from Secretary of State uh, James uh, Baker, who naturally blasted uh, Fra Francesc for having uh, done something that would sabotage his efforts to try to usher along what was actually a very cleverly designed uh, uh, package, which consisted of getting uh, the Sandinista government to uh, allow for elections, Ortega would uh, step down uh, early uh, in exchange for uh, the end of the U.S. support for uh, the Contras, and Ortega had asked for the U.N. and the OAS to monitor those elections, which otherwise they feared, the Sandinistas feared, would be rigged. So Baker calls up uh, the, the Secretary General and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Pérez de Cuer, who, uh, who was famous, among other things, for his poker face, uh, says to me, you know, your friend missed a brilliant opportunity to shut up, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but, I mean, he stood behind uh, Francesc fully uh, on this uh, Yes, on let's this, uh, say that question. I did... Let's put it like this. Go. Uh, I was under a slight cloud for two or three months, mm -hmm. and the FMLN was aware of that, and that's why they wanted to make sure about you know yeah. uh, about yes. the, when we had yes. the meeting in Montreal. Yeah. Well, and I'm also as to how we were going to to strengthen the Secretary General's hand in case he wavered. Well, this, this is actually what what, the, what uh, Francesca has just told us about is, a, I think, a, a, a classic uh, moment of decision for a uh, third party uh, on what to do. He had an opportunity. Uh, should he have done what his colleague from the OAS did? He was a Peruvian diplomat, by the way. His colleague from the OAS, uh, Hugo de Serra, oh, who essentially, the, 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 he, he gave, essentially, a... a yeah. Uh, oh, in, you know, in uh, this meeting, in, after in, in I Yamales. spoke, yes. Yes, yeah, he said essentially nothing. That's why he did not appear in the paper. <laughs> he, did not appear. <laughs> he did not appear in the paper, and the OAS played uh, uh, only a very <coughs> small role, uh, as it turned out. I've often wondered, uh, Francesco, what I would have done, done in, um, in your case. It was, a, it was an extraordinary opportunity, and 
Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it is thought that when, uh, as, and this is one of these classic cases, uh, you create a, a, a big power instigates or creates or strongly supports a force, um, it doesn't mean necessarily that they can just switch it off overnight. Right. There, I think that there's a, a lesson there. They have a way of uh, all of these groups. It probably applies to the Mujahideen and in their various the Americans incarnations. The have been very good at creating their own Frankenstein. But decreating them is the problem. Decreating them is not so easy. They look acquire life of their own, don't look they? Look at the Mujahideen, look at the Taliban. I mean, mm -hmm. in, the, in this case, the Pakistanis. It's known in CIA parlance as blowback, as I as I understand. Anyway, that was a, that was an important start. Now you you uh, spoke a bit about Guatemala. I don't want to linger uh, uh, too much uh, on on that. You were involved in setting up the Guatemala negotiations, with as I understand it, considerable help from the Norwegians, who were sort of uh, the the hosts and who are very good at playing the in, in the limelight. And, the, and therefore the Lutheran World Federation. The Lutheran World uh, Federation. But let's, uh, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, use this uh, as a sort of as a, as a touchstone to speak about, to branch out into uh, the merits and demerits of various actors uh, on the mediatory stage, if I can call it that way. Uh, I mean, there, is, there are certain international organizations, preponderantly, of course, the, the UN, the World Organization, that has, especially restarting in the second half of the 80s, played an important third-party role in various conflicts. There are some governments that have a, as a matter of policy, they try to solve conflicts if they get a chance. That includes the Norwegians, we just mentioned, the, the Swiss, there are other players once in a while, uh, uh, Turkey, for instance, particularly in the Middle East uh, region, uh, Qatar uh, sometimes, uh, Egypt uh, uh, as well. And then there are uh, non-governmental organizations that uh, do this. Can, can you say a, a few words about the merits and uh, demerits, the the comparative advantages and disadvantages of these various types of actors? Well, I think uh, at the very beginning of a conflict, or at the very beginning, not of a conflict perhaps, of international involvement in terms of mediation, there is, uh, it made sense to have sometimes an NGO involved because they are less threatening, because they can gather information that would be difficult let's say for the UN or for foreign ministries to gather. Um, <coughs> diplomats are posted in countries in conflict or where there is a potential conflict are not often very good at being able to tell what is going on because the, they tend to meet with government people, with the elite, and they often miss the plot. E.g. what happened in Iran when the Islamic Revolution broke out, for example. But I think, so I think the NGOs can play a, a, a very useful role and, and um, I, I found that on issues like Guatemala in particular and East Timor, NGOs such as Amnesty International and uh, the, uh, the Human Rights Watch and various other can be very useful. They can also be useful, uh, institutions like the CDH, the CHD, sorry, the Humanitarian Dialogue, the humanitarian dialogue in starting, in talking to uh, both um, governments and uh, non-governmental opposition groups uh, to at least begin a process of sounding them out. But when it comes to the real mediation, I think that you've got to have one credibility, two uh, legitimacy to some degree, uh, three, even if you don't have carrots and sticks as such, and the UN uh, mediator does not have carrots and sticks himself, but he, can rel he has a gamut of uh, institutions and possibilities available. He has member states he can rely on, 
He has the international financial institutions. Um, he has, at some point, perhaps the Security Council. That depends on, on the issue. <clears throat> and, um, and I think that, at the same time, the Secretary General has no vested interest in one side or the other necessarily winning. He may be sympathetic to a, one of the sides in terms of morally feeling that perhaps they are on the right, in the right. But um, it, will, it has not, nothing to gain from uh, mediation uh, as such. And um, I think that some of the countries you mentioned uh, either, for example, much as I, I think the Emir of Qatar is probably an extremely interesting and uh, gentleman, the fact is that, the, that, for example, Gulf countries do not have the personnel. They have the resources, the money, but they don't have the trained personnel to carry out uh, mediation. Um, Nigeria, for example, which has often sought to mediate in West Africa, uh, is in a way the, the superpower of the region and therefore often is not seen as entirely impartial. Uh, the same applies if the US tried to mediate in some other, uh, some other disputes at 7-1, which you deal with on other occasions. But um, so I think the UN is now, I think you can change the mediator. You can move step by step from an NGO to a, a government and then to the UN. What I don't think is a good idea is to have more than one mediator at the same time. Once a serious process of negotiation starts, one should play the piano with two hands and not four. And the less crooks in the kitchen, the better. Uh, and so, as you will recall, and you were extremely good at doing, um, and I help you, of course, to get rid of the OAS, playing the slightest role in Central America. They, uh, after the Caragua, where they did play a minor role, as you indicated, uh, in El Salvador, they were, I think you told the parties very clearly that they had to choose between the UN or the OAS. Uh, we didn't, he, you did not say, I think, choose between a Mercedes and a, and a, and East, uh, and a Lada, but um, at any rate, they chose. And by the time we got to Guatemala, the OES was completely marginalized. Um, uh, but it, it's the sort of the, an important element in all of that is the UN being the address for Peacekeeping, peacemaking, as ah. well as peacekeeping. Yes. Meaning, uh, if when uh, I mean, I, I certainly told them, listen, when you uh, you have uh, uh, decided that you want whatever agreements you reach uh, to be verified by the United Nations, uh, and uh, that means that we will have to deploy a presence in your country, and really. Uh, the UN has, of course, by far and away the most experienced institutional memory uh, uh, of other uh, in, uh, of other organizations. But we were talking in the corridor before coming here. I'm not sure, not quite sure how the subject came up about Mozambique, which is a, a slightly uh, quirky uh, experience, where essentially it was an NGO that somehow found itself leading negotiations, and then when they were actually coming to terms, called in uh, a certain number of governments and the UN. Uh, could, could you talk about that uh, a bit? I can't really because Mozambique was, uh, I, I, I was not in the position you were uh, as Chief of Staff of the Secretary General that you had um, an eye on every single issue. Uh, I, I, was I heard not you voicing an opinion on the subject. Uh, I voiced the <laughs> Notwithstanding. <laughs> I voiced the I voiced opinion. First, as I always tell the uh, anyone who listens, that every conflict is different. So it's very hard to draw, a to I mean, uh, uh, to, to draw rules as to how you're going to successfully mediate the conflict. But on the whole, um, we have we uh, have normally thought that you, it was better if it's 
the UN and, and NGO that the causes of a conflict need to be addressed if possible, that human rights should be an important element if there has been a history of human rights violations, and, uh, that, um, and that amnesties should not be encouraged, and probably some amnesties one should keep away from. Um, so uh, I think uh, our very Christian friends from the uh, community of Sant'Egidio uh, actually broke a lot of these rules, but it actually they actually uh, reached an extremely lasting agreement, uh, which was then implemented by the UN, but which they were the authors, and it turned out that perhaps it was not the right moment in Mozambique to start uh, or having trials of those who had committed terrible atrocities, as there had been, particularly by Renamo. Uh, and uh, it actually worked. Well, I think also Aldo Agello, who was the, the verifier, as it were, the UN verifier, or the, the SRFG, um, did also a very good job. Yeah, and he had, of course, a lot of uh, uh, Italian democratic uh, political savvy and the deep pockets, right. which helped uh, as well in, in uh, Mozambique. Now, uh, could you tell us a, a, a little bit uh, about East Timor? You were involved in that very uh, sort of that long, those long years where there were uh, meetings between the uh, Portuguese and the Indonesians, and there were discussions about the possibility of some sort of an autonomy regime, which in, in the event uh, was, was not followed. Uh, now, could, could you tell us about how, one, uh, how the movement from a project to persuade Indonesia to accept some sort of an autonomy regime for East Timor evolved into actual self-determination well, and independence? Well, I think for the first, I mean, I, I was involved in the good office, on the good officer side between 93 and, ni and 99. And I think it was clear that between 90 and, and that for the first five years, there was no chance of having a settlement in East Timor that would be fair. And the, Indonesia, the Indonesians always had in mind to replicate in East Timor what they had successfully uh, done with uh, West New Guinea, with uh, Iria and Jaya. Uh, in other words, they had managed to acquire the territory, and then there had been a, a, a sham consultation of the population in 1969 uh, with the cooperation of the Secretariat. Of the, uh, I think it's one of the most shameful pages in the Secretariat's history. And you should read the report uh, of the Secretary General of 1969 on the act of free choice, so-called, in West New Guinea. So the Indonesians were also hoping that they would do the same in East Timor, that something far short from a referendum would take place. For example, they were toying with the idea that perhaps there could be a delegation of three UN members, member states, one chosen by Indonesia, one chosen by Portugal, a third chosen by the other two, which would go to the territory, canvas opinions, and return, and say, well, in our view, the majority of the population, presumably the, the Indonesians hope, uh, seem to be very happy with integration. Um, so we spent some time trying to discourage, I mean, uh, there was someone else with me, Tambrat Samuel, who today was also at Princeton, in fact. Uh, I think the two, I mean, first of all, it's very important to have a small team with everybody being in the same wavelength. I think we achieved that, uh, you, you very successfully showed to me in, East, in El Salvador how a small team could do it. And um, so we had a, even a smaller team in the case of East Timor, it was mainly Tambrat and myself, so I think we avoided a bad settlement because at times the Portuguese themselves did not believe that they would succeed in forcing Indonesia 
to have an act of self-determination. Then, of course, we waited for the window of opportunity. Now, I must confess, I was, uh, the window of opportunity, I didn't expect to occur so soon. Um, in 1998, the uh, economic crisis, the Asian economic crisis, 1997, the Asian economic crisis hit Indonesia. Uh, the um, uh, demonstrate uh, the the silent understanding between the Suharto and the population that the population would accept the rule of Suharto in return for growth in uh, an improvement in their in their livelihoods disappeared once the economic crisis hit Indonesia. So by May 1998, Suharto was out. A new president came in, and we, and that was where the opportunity, when the opportunity arose. Then the Indonesians proposed autonomy. It was only then that really they thought, they suggested a broad a statute of autonomy, and that's how we began negotiating this broad statute of autonomy, which, in rules that you developed and that I followed, uh, was were prepared by the UN Secretariat. We. Both of us, I think we can say, we do not think it's a good idea for the parties to a conflict to exchange position papers to each other. Uh, they are much more likely to be rejected. It is much better if they want to present the paper, they give it to us. So we prepared the statute of autonomy. It was a real serious statute of autonomy, drawing on Hong Kong and on, particularly on the Hong Kong um, statute and on some other statutes uh, like the Allen Islands and so on. But the one issue on which everything got done was that we said the Timorese, we can, uh, Portugal and Indonesia may agree on the statute of autonomy, but at some point the Timorese have to decide by themselves whether they like this statute of autonomy or they don't. And at that point, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, wrote a letter to uh, President Habibi, basically saying, in my view, go for the white autonomy, but uh, in our view, you are going to have to ask the, people, the population five years later if they, want, they are happy with it. And then Habibi, who was a very emotional man, uh, hit, the, hit the roof and said, no, this is unacceptable, we are not a colonial power. Uh, because this was drawn partly from an agreement reached on New Caledonia between the French government and the Canucks in New Caledonia, where uh, the Canucks are to the, well, the people of New Caledonia will decide in another eight years now whether they want to remain with France or become independent. So uh, that was something that Habibi thought was a terrible idea. And then he suddenly said, if they want to be independent, let them be independent now. And that's what changed, of course, the entire course. Um, and that's how eventually we got East Timor, the Timorese, to be able to s decide their own future. Now, before moving to Afghanistan, because the time has come I think uh, for that. Need to yes. Could you, could, you, could you tell us just a, a word about Myanmar, which is a infertile field that right. both you and I have plowed. Well, on, on Burma, I, I think the one, the one thing, I, 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 I haven't probably, I haven't succeeded in that, those men, in, in, in quite a number of negotiations, but I've been quite good at getting the UN involved. In this case, when I became director for Asia and the Pacific, I felt that there were not enough conflicts to fill up my plate, except for East Timor. And, um, I always had a good relationship with Sweden, and I, uh, Sweden piloted the resolution on the human rights situation in Myanmar or Burma uh, in the General Assembly. And it was a very long, it's always a, a rather lengthy resolution that is not only on human rights, it also includes the return of democracy, elections, freedom for Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, etc. In other words, it's, uh, it's a kind of roadmap towards democracy. So I went to the Swedes, uh, and it was always approved by consensus, without a vote, because the Burmese regime at that time feared that if there was a vote, 
they probably would get only three or four votes in favor. So it was better in, in favor of them. And uh, so I went to the Swedes and said, why don't you add one paragraph at the end of the resolution this year? Just add the following. Requests the Secretary General to assist in the implementation of this resolution. Now, uh, so they said, <laughs> so I said, uh, so uh, the, we discussed with the Swedes, so wh what do you mean by that? Well, I, I say they are asking the Secretary General, you're asking the Secretary General to help in implementing the roadmap. But if the uh, Burmese asked, the, the, the government asked, just say that we will, is simply a request to the Secretary General to provide services to the special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Burma, which had already existed. So that's the way it happened. And the resolution was adopted, and then it was our task, because then you were on the 38th floor and I was uh, a floor below. It was our task to persuade Butros Ghali, not necessarily the most moral uh, human being that I ever met. It was a matter then <laughs> of persuading Butros Ghali to become involved in Burma because he now had a mandate. And um, in due course, um, uh, about four months later, the UN be, uh, sent the first envoy, it was Rafi Uli Ahmed, uh, and I went along to, to, to Burma. But with little to show for it, you will admit. Ah, uh, but I, mean, I think... I, I freely admit it. My, my question is, do you think that, that today there's the right any it. prospect uh, of... Uh, I think I am very glad I did it, and we did it. And because first, for example, when you had... I mean, the issue as a result of having this good officer's mission, uh, we have had, uh, when the when the demonstrations took place in Rangoon in September of 97, oh, 07, sorry, um, the Security Council dealt with the issue. And it dealt with the issue because there was already an envoy. I think that, and I think for the Burmese, the knowledge, at least the, there is some hope that there is the UN, which I think, at least until recently, I'm not sure anymore, but I think the UN, for poor countries and for destitute people remains the, a major hope. I think that the knowledge that the UN, even if with no success, is trying to do something, I think it's important. And I think that one could create, if one, I were to be involved, one could create some, we are there waiting for the window of opportunity to open. And it may open, as it almost did, uh, in September uh, 2007. Now, could you, in order to, before moving on to it, uh, please give us a snapshot, in, in, if you can, in, in two minutes, uh, of where Afghanistan uh, is now. No, now. I really do think, uh, sorry to take this, I really think that I, I, I have a train to catch to Washington. So in, we can't stay beyond, I can't stay beyond 7th, 30th, so maybe I should. Or should we just open it to questions because without a word on Afghanistan? Well, I suspect somebody will ask right. the question. Will someone ask the question on Afghanistan? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't plant this. I well, let, let's put it like this. Uh, I'll try and say it in, three, in two minutes so that we don't. Um, I think we, we had a window of opportunity in Afghanistan, uh, 11th of September 2001. Uh, I suppose I owe to uh, Al-Qaeda and to the Taliban the little fame I may have got in the last few years. Um, the window opened in, 2000, uh, in, in uh, September 2001. Uh, in my view, we should have the, the Afghan people were ready for not only for a military intervention, which it occurred, but were ready for a heavy footprint of the UN to, uh, to rebuild the country, which had been completely shattered. 
Um, we had a disagreement with uh, a colleague of mine who, who happened to be just a little bit higher than me uh, on this issue. He um, won. He wanted a, 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 a light footprint. I wanted a heavy one. Um, but there were other mistakes. It would be wrong to just uh, one mistake at that time was that the Americans were not interested in having NATO deployed in Afghanistan, although now they are betting, they've been betting NATO for the last five years. So ISAF was confined to Kabul. Um, the, uh, a very good man was chosen uh, by the internationals, of course, uh, to be the feet ahead, that was President Karzai. But by convening the Bonn Conference late, too late, as opposed to a bit earlier, uh, the Northern Alliance commanders, who were the same people who had brought ruin to Afghanistan in the mid-90s, had already taken over two-thirds of the country. And the result was that from the beginning, we had to give major positions of power to the warlords and commanders of the 90s. And there was no interest on the part of the international community in forcing the, uh, the warlords and commanders to be disarmed and basically to go home on the basis of you can win, you can keep your ill-gotten gains, but from now on you are simply you can play a political role if you wish, but with no weapons around. Now, we failed in that. Uh, Iraq took, uh, the, in a way, most of the focus on Afghanistan for reasons that I find absolutely incredible, but I could imagine. Uh, there was total blindness towards Pakistan, although it was, no, it was obvious that the Taliban had found refuge in, uh, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. And then you base, we basically did not, were not able to present to the Afghan people a model of a new Afghanistan that would be more appealing than the one they had been used to before. The, what we gave them was a corrupt government because these warlords and commanders were corrupt. Uh, we gave them uh, um, uh, <coughs> bad governance in the provinces. We failed to deliver services. The rule of law institutions, mind you, is not only in Afghanistan, but in many places were left behind as not a priority. So uh, that has enabled the, the, the combination of this plus Pakistan has enabled the Taliban to become active again. And I think what you basically have is that amongst the Pashtuns in particular, a feeling that they are basically sitting on the fence. They do not necessarily like the Taliban, but at the same time, they see no reason to fight for something that doesn't sound particularly appetizing, that hasn't delivered much to them. And of course, and in terms of the international military presence, uh, one thing was for, for the Afghans to accept uh, an international a military presence in 2002. One, another one is in two, seven years later, to have an even larger presence when the Afghans feel that the pre international presence has been accompanied by growing insecurity. It has sort of drawn fire. Uh, in, in, in other words, it's, uh, they would, it's, uh, I mean, in, in the minds of the Afghans, it's incomprehensible how the strongest power on earth can go to Afghanistan and instead of being able to put down the, an insurgency, the insurgency continues to increase. And that leads them then to all kinds of conspiracy theories as to why the Western countries are, are in Afghanistan. You made clear uh, earlier that uh, obviously you, on the, you were on the side of intrusiveness and uh, uh, heavy uh, footprint, at, or at least you were on the side of intrusiveness uh, in terms of, uh, yes. of peacemaking, uh, certainly. But in peacekeeping doesn't, and uh, sort of the follow-up uh, of, of agreements, doesn't, aren't there lessons to be drawn uh, from this uh, experience about how long you can maintain an intrusion before it becomes, uh, before it's rejected? Well, by I mean, I, I'm not 
saying that the international presence is at the moment rejected. I think Afghans are of, are, 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 are like most humans. They, they, we are sometimes contradictory. Uh, on the one side, they really dislike, I think, by now, the, the, military, the international military presence. At the same time, if we were to say to the Afghans, right, in, by the end of June, the international force, by the end of this year, the international forces will be withdrawn. They would probably say, please stay. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a complicated issue. Um, on the one side, they are afraid that, uh, that we are looking for an exit strategy and that we will abandon them in the way we did, the international community did in the, between 1989 and 2001. On the other side, they do resent this overwhelming, overbearing pre international presence. And I have to say that uh, American forces in particular are not the most subtle and nimble uh, people that uh, to be found. And that does create enormous resentment, particularly the fact that there are civilian casualties, of course almost unavoidable, but uh, uh, given the fact that, uh, that um, homes are broken into by uh, US forces and detentions take place, and of course that the Badram, the, uh, Badram remains a detention center with more people now in it, over 600, than in Guantanamo at the moment. But nevertheless, in, in uh, Iraq, under the new uh, counterinsurgency doctrine that was adopted just two or three years ago, and the approach that has been uh, followed, it has shown a certain versatility uh, on the part of, uh, of US uh, uh, forces. Could you say a word about the new policy that has been followed starting with the Obama administration uh, in Afghanistan yeah. and as well as the, the idea of approaching uh, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan as a single theater in effect, AFPAC. Well, uh, I think that the Obama, and, and I'm sorry to be critical because uh, I, I think the Obama administration is doing a lot of right, good things at the moment. But I don't think the policy towards Afghanistan is that new. I think a lot of it began to be developed by Petraeus and by even by the, the, the by the Defense uh, Ministry, in, uh, Ministry, the Department of Defense in Washington, already in the last year of the Bush administration. I think uh, Obama has been caught by a promise that he made during the campaign. Uh, to increase the size of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan while withdrawing them from Iraq, partly because he didn't want to be labeled a peacenik. Um, I think he's now been caught and therefore he, he's sending more forces. The most visible aspect of the new policy will be more forces because other issues that he mentions uh, will take much longer to achieve. Uh, I think dealing with uh, realizing that the issue of Afghanistan can't be resolved without addressing Pakistan is right. <coughs> At the same time, they are not the same. They are, uh, they are very closely related, but they are not the same. And um, I, uh, I worry that there are voices in Washington, in the administration, which, which seem to be saying democracy in Afghanistan is, is really, we're not, going to, we're not there to build another Sweden. Now, I've always feared this, I always tell the Swedes that. Since I was a young man in Spain, I always heard this kind of thing. Spain, when some of us wanted democracy, the comment was, we are not Scandinavians, you know, we, we are not ready, we, we don't know how to handle a democracy. Then you go to Latin America, the same. Latin America, no, Chile, it's not, it's not a Sweden. Let's not try and make a Sweden there. And now all of a sudden, we are being accused or told that the Bush administration was trying to create another Sweden. First, the Bush administration had no interest in creating democracy in, Afgan in Afghanistan. They wanted to get rid of, of, of Al Qaeda and ta the Taliban and were supporting Karzai because they felt comfortable with him. 
But second, uh, the idea that Pakistan, the, the, the democratic forces in Pakistan need to be strengthened while at the same time not doing the same in Afghanistan, to me, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. And I think there is an element of, by some in the administration, I think there are contradictory views, who are looking for an exit strategy. And if they could suddenly, if, and therefore, there are, again, they are contradicting themselves. On the one side, they are saying Karzai is corrupt, or rather the Karzai administration is corrupt. At the same time, they seem to be saying, well, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, what we don't want is Al-Qaeda and Taliban. That's it. Not Taliban and Tali, even. So it's a confused approach, which may be clarified as time goes on. I mean, it's only uh, very, very early on. I suspect that there are all kinds of views uh, that Obama has to deal with, in other words, within the role of the military, I mean, of the US military, in having a major say in policy is obvious. Uh, that's why, for example, there is no talk of closing Bagram. There is no talk of having a status of forces agreement with Afghanistan. Um, um, but at the same time, there are, there are other signals that, yes, we want a government that the Afghans will be happy with. Sure. Uh, do you think there is a political, sort of a better political solution to the problem of Afghanistan and Afghanistan? Well, I think that um, what you need is uh, to support, I mean, we need to support a, a level playing field in the election. We should not be supporting any candidate, but I think that we should be supporting a team. Team, a team and a program, and a clear program. Um, second, we need to, I, it is highly doubtful, in my view, that a transparent and credible election can be held in Afghanistan at the moment, with the security situation being as bad as it is. I think that 50% uh, of the Pashtun districts, and therefore a fourth of the districts in Afghanistan, are virtually no-go areas. So how you're going to admin, uh, carry out an election there with no international civilian observers who will not be able to go, and or even probably not many national observers, it leaves the door open to enormous manipulation. And of course the Afghans, unlike the Westerners, believe already that there will be a manipulation. So you don't need to do much for the election to be regarded as illegitimate. And then we will have a big problem, too. Questions back? Yes. Um, two questions. One, with regard to Pakistan, who do you consider to be the actors that would be the right people to be in charge of Pakistan? And the second is, do you ever No, I don't envisage Al Qaeda at the, at the table. Uh, at the, uh, I, I would have thought that uh, this would be Afghanistan, Pakistan, would have been something, a big thing, but something for the UN to do. Um, there was a, uh, there was talk uh, a year and a half ago of um, a 1,000 pound gorilla appointed by the Secretary General to go to Afghanistan. Now, this was going to be Lord Ashdown, although it was less the idea of the UN, it was more the idea of the US. Uh, that failed. They sent instead a very good man, but he was probably a 700 pound gorilla as opposed to a thousand, but extremely good. That's uh, probably, special, that's a requirement. Uh, but now, of course, uh, an 1800 pound gorilla has appeared in the form of Holbrook. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, <laughs> so I think that one has to be realistic. He's going to be the key player, at least for a considerable time. It may be that if he fails, uh, they may turn to the UN, because it's always when things look pretty hopeless that there is a tendency to come to the UN. <laughs> yes. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Empire 
Yeah, you know, this is a very uh, sorry to, uh, uh, but uh, the tribal. I mean, let's not. If we got into the tribal issue here, we would stay until midnight. Uh, so I, I just say I would simply say that um, it is remarkable that the Afghans have put up with a foreign military, a foreign military presence for over seven years. This is longer than during World War II. I mean, it's been longer than World War II. And um, uh, I'm not saying that, um, I think that the amount of time that the Afghans are willing to give us, and the amount of time that our public opinion, at least in Europe and Canada, I don't know it so much in the US, uh, the amount of time that the pub our public opinion will give us is very limited. and. It would be a mistake if we were to say we need to be involved in Afghanistan because we are fighting Al Qaeda. This is too too abstract a concept, considering that Al Qaeda is uh, a franchise rather than a small and a centralized organization. And I think that um, uh, if people are not going to be very keen to fight in Afghanistan if they see that this is the country is governed, badly governed, uh, with corrupt people, and therefore it is essential to improve as quickly as possible governance, rule of law, and, uh, and guarantee people a minimum, uh, more employment that we've been able to, to give them. And I think I have to leave. Yes, uh, perhaps one, one more, more question. Well, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I had the good fortune just the other day to sit with Mr. De Soto and talk about the role of personalities in, in doing mediation and peace negotiations. And uh, we spent a great deal of time on so I'll try to just ask a quick question to you, which would be something like, can you can you talk about what qualities or traits, personality traits? Well, because we're in a rush, yes. uh, you give me an opportunity to pay tribute to Alvaro. Alvaro is a, an excellent uh, mediator because um, he, the, first of all, you need to deliver messages clearly. And two, you should not be afraid to stand up to the strong. And you should be able to put up with pressure from the strong. In the Salvadorian negotiations, uh, we all, but he in particular, was under very strong pressure from the uh, Bush, the father, administration to reach a quick agreement on El Salvador, uh, mainly human rights, and uh, which was one of the first things that were, was, were agreed to, and demobilize, have elections, and go home. And we, and he in particular, stood his ground, no, there are many issues in El Salvador that need to be addressed, and major changes that should be made if we want a lasting uh, solution. So you do need someone who uh, 
almost enjoys standing up to the strong. Um, of course, but it, it helps if he is fully supported by his boss. And Alvaro de Soto had the full support of Perez de Cuella. Um, but I think you need this. You need uh, someone who has imagination, who um, likes to, um, to innovate. Uh, I think it's, used, it's good to aim high, because if you aim high, maybe, you, maybe by luck you will succeed. And if you don't aim high, uh, you might in, end up a little bit below. But aiming low, in my view, is a mistake. One has to, one is, one, it's amazing what you can get away with at times in negotiations. Well, Francesca and Raul.